So the export is pretty easy and the import is really not that much different. I wanted to walk through a, a pretty common scenario here. So let's take a flat file and load it into our database. So this is actually a very common data export, data import situation. So we call these flat files. You probably know it as a text file if you haven't heard of flat file uh, before. Uh, let me just make a new text file here, um, and we'll call it um, um, players. I, I don't know. This is It's very common that you will export data from one system so that you can import it into another system. Okay, The flat file is the lowest common denominator. Every database system can export to text, export as CSV, comma, separated values, right? So CSV... Uh, equals comma separated values, okay? Um, uh, execute as text. Uh, I've seen lots of these. Some of them will have no extension. The extension does not mean anything, really. I mean, it could be a text extension or a CSV. Um, it's the content that defines what that it's a flat file, okay? So we're going to have a flat file called players.txt. And I'm going to go ahead, let me, uh, let's set up our fonts to be large enough to where humans can read them. And we'll just add some things in here. So we'll add in uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Just ask about Ibra. No, I had it right. And he's a striker. And then you'd have... Wayne Rooney, and we'll call him an attacking midfield. It just depends on which team he's playing for, I suppose. Um, who else? Um, Jesus Navas. Midfield. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on uh, names. Michael uh, Essien. Uh, defender now, so we'll have these. Now, what is this column, this last column? We really don't know, right? There is no context included in this text file. There is no metadata associated with this text file that says this is the position column, this is the last name, and this is the first name. And your text files do not require this sort of context slash metadata. It's handy to have it, though, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we had a a th the first line up here that specified the column names that said this is first name, this is last name, and this is preferred position, or I, I don't know. Okay, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> well, I would guess that a full half, if not more, of your text slash flat files that you ever work with will simply have no context or no header information. It's kind of a pain, but that just is up to the people who wrote the export utility. Uh, sometimes a company just doesn't want to make it all that easy on you to get data out of their system. <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and save this file. And our goal here is to import these so that these become new rows in a SQL Server table. Right? And like I said, a very common situation, you might have orders that are taken all day long in an Oracle system. And then you have your SQL Server relational database, your relational data warehouse, you need to import from Oracle. And you would simply run a routine at night that exports the Oracle changed data to a text file. And then the next morning, it loads that text files data into the SQL Server data warehouse. Okay, this happens all day, every day, all over the world. The very, very common uh, ETL strategy is to use a, a text file as sort of the intermediary here. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, load this up here. Now we have a couple of options. We could go to the SQL Server 2012 folder and go to the import export data. And do we have to worry about 32 bit? Okay, we actually don't. If we're going to SQL Server. Okay. So if our source is a flat file, who cares, 32-bit, 64-bit, doesn't matter. If our destination is SQL 2012, doesn't make a difference whether it's 32-bit or 62-bit. Okay. So this is actually a case where it won't make a difference in terms of us getting an error message, maybe in terms of uh, the performance because of memory usage or something else, but we will not get an error message by choosing the 32-bit. So you can either choose the one straight from the start menu, 
or you can launch Management Studio, go down to your source database or your destination either, and choose it from there. Okay, so I will do the latter. I will go to the, we'll choose the IIS logs database here as our destination. Uh, right now it just has a single table. So here's what I'll do. I'll right click on the database, tasks, and does it matter if I choose import or export? <laughs> no, same wizard gets launched, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and go through here. Our data source is going to be the flat file. And I go down and I just simply locate the file, players.txt. And when I do, it you know, automatically reads this file and starts trying to figure it out. It tries to understand how many columns there are, what data types that the data in these columns are, what's the delimiter, is there a delimiter, okay? So let's just kind of talk about this metadata that we've, we see that it's interpreted. It picks up that we are in the United States and that we're using a code page 1252. That's what's called the Latin one general code set. This is what you would use if you are working with the English language here, okay? If you're working with Swedish, you're going to use a different code page for na native Swedish <coughs> Unicode files. Uh, we can choose whether we're working with Unicode or not. Uh, we can also choose whether the format is delimited, such as by a comma, a semicolon. Okay, you know what that means, right? It means every column value has a delimiter at the end that says, okay, that's the end of the column value. Let's begin the next column. Okay, we chose a comma for the previous one, right? So ours is delimited. Uh, it could be fixed width, like you could say, you know, every column is 50 uh, characters wide. Um, is there a qualifier around the text? So did I say, quote, uh, Rooney? No, I didn't. I just said Rooney without the quotes, right? So there is no qualifier, but a text qualifier would be something like that, a double quotes around just the text values. Numerics would not have quotes. Uh, dates would not have quotes, and that's how the engine would interpret those, okay? And we do have context with the data. The column names are in the first row, okay? Now, it's picked out also the columns. So it's done this automatically. It's read this flat file. It says that the row delimiter is the carriage return line feed, okay? See, uh, that's just a new line, okay? Sometimes you know that as a slash in. Uh, slash r slash n, just depending on what you're working with here, okay? And then it reads that there are four rows, and you can actually see that they are in positions two through five. What's position one? Position one would have been that header row, right? And if I were to uncheck the box over here to say, well, those are not column names in the first data row, well, now you can see we get an ordinal position. And it always kind of bugged me here that column zero, you know, but yet it's row one. Why not use the same zero-based start or one-based start? Uh, I'm whining, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, so back over here, I'll, I will set it to where the first names have uh, the first row has column headers, um, and it is separated by a comma within the file. And if I get this wrong, then there's no data, right? It just it says, well, okay, fine. I found no semicolon in this data, so all of that data must be intended for the first row the first column, because you said that the next row begins on a new line, and there we go. Okay? Now, if I were to say, uh, say a space or some other column uh, that was actually found, I need to refresh, we would see a different set here. Uh, under advanced, you can actually define the data types for the integration services pipeline. It's going to default here to data type string, DTSTR. Uh, but you can change these to integers and decimals, and you can set their widths and things like that, okay? Um, and you can see for the final column, it does say, hey, the column is over. The end of the column is the control line feed, okay? And we say next, so we've picked it out. And it can, by the way, suggest types. You can have it go through and sample the data and have it suggest these types. And you can see that it has changed our suggested output width from 50 to 7, from 50 to 12. Where did it get these values, you think? Right, it looked at the largest values in that column and said, OK, well, it no, doesn't need to be 50. You can drop it down to 19. Uh, say next. And now we're at the destination. 
Okay, so this is really the ETL process, right? We started by defining the source, which we extract, okay? And then now here we are at the destination. We're defining the destination, which is our load. We're saying where we want to load the data. So here after this screen, you can imagine that we're going to put in our transformation, right? So that will strangely kind of be after this, okay? Um, so I choose, now I'm going to go to the SQL Server 2012 instance, and I'm going to go make whatever I'm going to work with in the INS logs database. I say next, grab the source, grab here. Notice the icon. It's that little shiny table worksheet looking icon that says, hey, I'm going to create a new table. Okay. So you can edit this, go to edit mappings. Okay. And you can see the defaults it has because you chose to suggest types. It defaults to creating these. These are the destination types, okay? These are types at the destination now, okay? And you can change these up as you wish. You might want to say, you know what? I don't want these to be null. And I want this to be 75. And you, I need you to be 75. But preferred position, maybe that's 128 or whatever that you want, okay? So when we click on this, you see down in this bottom section here, it's telling you what the pipeline sees the original data type. This is the source data type. This is now the destination data type, okay? You've defined it. Now, we are choosing to create the destination table. Why? Because it defaults to players. So it says, okay, we'll make a new table named players. Maybe that's not what you want. You can click up here and say, edit SQL, okay? And by the way, if the table did exist, you could say, delete the rows and then add these, or just add these rows to the existing table, okay? But since there is no table, dbo.players, then it's choosing this for us. Now, if I edit SQL, this is something you will often do, okay? This is the create table statement that SSIS will issue against the destination. Okay. So it's going to create a table in the DBO schema called players. And it's going to say, you know, first name, last name, preferred position. Where's the primary key? There's not one. It will never suggest a primary key for a text file data source or an Excel spreadsheet source. It doesn't infer to that level. It leaves it to you to create a foreign key, uh, sorry, a primary key. So if you wanted a primary key, you could come in, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, you could come in here and say, <laughs> you have to actually hit control with enter for it to break a new line. Otherwise it just hits the okay button. So you could come in here and say, you know what? I want a line ID. It's an int, it's not null. It's an identity column. I'll, I'll let me type this and I'll bring it up and I'll make it a primary key. Okay. So you can add this in. I've just added an identity column primary key. So this would be, you know, the first row would be, uh, because I said start at one, the first row would have line ID one. And the next row, because I said increment by one, would have line ID two, and then three, and then four. Okay. So now I say, okay, and if I click auto generate, then it will wipe it away and just go back to the original here. Okay. So here we're set now. And notice that you can change these. You can say, you know what? I want to ignore this particular column. I don't, but that's what you can do. We say, okay. I say next and I can run it. I can save it just like we did before. So we'll choose to run this one. We'll say finish. Loads the data, says four rows were transferred. Okay. And we can say close. And we can actually verify that. We can go run a query here in Management Studio, go to the IIS logs. DBO got players. And sure enough, we were able to load those that data into that. Okay. Very common way to do it. Let's come back in the next video and let's explore a little deeper and let's talk about creating solutions and packages directly within data tools, SQL Server data tools.